three quarter. Thank you for that comment, Pete. Welcome, welcome, everybody. This is the Thursday evening Viper Trading Webinar. If you are here to learn to trade the futures markets using the Viper tools, you're absolutely in the right place. Before we can get started, we have to go through our standard disclaimer. All communications from Viper Trading Systems are for educational purposes only. Futures and Forex trading does involve risk, and there is a risk of loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or other webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody in here does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. Uh, okay. So let's get on to uh, the subject at hand here, which is uh, tonight's topic is dealing with whipsaws, particularly at the open. This actually came up, um, I want to say, a, a week or two ago uh, when, when, when we had a couple of very choppy summer mornings. By the way, before we get started, I see there's a lot of fresh new faces, a lot of people visiting, a lot, a lot of people taking free trials. We've got kind of this, uh, a summer open house kind of thing going on for a couple of weeks here. So let me just orient everybody as to what you're looking at. So. What we do is we trade futures markets intraday, so we don't hold any overnight positions, okay? We don't hit, hold anything long-term. It's not a swing trading operation. It's strictly intraday. By the close of business every day, we are flat, okay? Now, we, I'm going to show you a quick list of futures instruments that we track. We don't trade all these actively, but we can watch them. If, if a future instrument starts with a six, like these top, few here. These are all what we call, um, you know, there might be a better way to do this. Let me just show you, let, let me show it to you this way real quick. We use the NinjaTrader platform. I think everybody knows that. And by the way, if you've been with us for a while, just bear with me for a couple of minutes while I quickly orient everybody who's visiting here, okay? So in NinjaTrader, you have what's called an instrument manager. And here is where all the instruments are shown, okay? Now up here, like in the room, for instance, you hear uh, Gary reference this 6B. This is the British pound futures. Now the equivalent to this in the Forex market would be the GBP, British pound, USD, US dollar, cross pair. They trade almost identical to each other, only this is a futures version of that same instrument. Likewise, here you can see 6E is the euro which would be very much like the Euro, Euro uh, USD cross pair in, in Forex. We also watch just a few other ones. Now, the reason that these British pound and the Euro are so volatile, does anybody have idea? Are you anybody tracking the news here? Why is the British pound so volatile right now? Why is everybody trading 6B and the British pound? Does anybody have any idea? Why is a lot of traders trading that right now? Why are they doing that? Anybody follow the news? What's, what's, what's been happening recently fueling volatility in the pound? Good. Good. You guys are on it. Everybody, guys and gals tonight, you're on it. You're on it. The Brexit. So most of you know, of course, if you don't, the euro was set up back. I didn't even know until I did a little research on this. The euro goes all the way back to like after World War II. And the quick history of it is that... Uh, after World War II, when uh, Germany, of course, in the war, and it divided all of Europe and, and all the you know, turmoil that came along with the war there, they decided to form a, a, a union to allow uh, people to uh, flow cross-border. Uh, they created a new currency uh, you know, called the euro, which can be used in any country, of course. And the uh, uh, bottom line was that uh, that's been going, that was the 40s, right? So what is that, 60, 70 years? And uh, England's in there, France, of course, all the big countries in Europe are in there. And the other problem with that is that it created a whole other level of bureaucracy. And so, you know, they said, I think it's in Brussels. Is it in Brussels where the Euro headquarters is? The, the, it, I mean, it's, just, it's like a whole other government, basically. And what happens is all these countries have to, have to send in essentially what's another tax, basically, kind of like a form of our federal tax. And long story short, some of the countries haven't been too happy about that because they've taken money from some countries to fuel problems in, in countries like Greece. So what happened recently was, I think this is what, about a week, week and a half, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, the um, England 
voted to get out of the euro, not be part of the euro, euro agreement any longer. Uh, of course, they always had the British pound. So in England, you could, you could uh, use euros, you could use British pounds. So they retained their own currency, but they don't want to keep sending, I don't know what it is, tens of billions of pounds a month to this European group, and so it's created a big thing. So what that's done is it's fueled huge volatility in 6B and 6E. In fact, we'll pull up a 6B chart before we close the room here t tonight, okay? Anyway, working our way down, just, of course, you know the other things that we trade here. We trade the equities, which is, uh, we trade crude oil, excuse me, CL. $10 a tick, it's on the September contract, it just rolled recently. Gary uh, gets up early. Pit open on that is 6 a.m. Pacific. Most of you know, of course, he opens the room five, 10 minutes before that, so we, you guys can, uh, everybody who trades oil, take advantage of the early oil moves. Uh, the other things we trade, of course, are the uh, Russell, TF. That's ten dollars a tick. Gary trades that a lot. I don't. I just. I watch it. I don't really trade it too much. Most of you know I trade the Nasdaq futures and Q, and YM, which is the Dow mini futures. Those are both five dollars a tick. By the way, just a quick word for those of you who are new and visiting. Inst one of the key things, and I really just. I'm going to just say, very quickly mention this. One of the key elements to success for you is to pick an instrument that is conducive to your trading style. All of these, think of it like um, little kids, if you will, or friends or relatives. You know how everybody had, kind of has their own personality? Well, it's the same way with the markets here, okay? Crude oil trades differently than, um, you know, NASDAQ. NASDAQ is normally different than the Russell. YM sometimes does its own thing, like this morning, right? Uh, the other markets were heading up, or NASDAQ will do that, right? Some markets will be heading down and NASDAQ's heading up. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. So the thing is you have to real you have to experiment with several different instruments to find out which one best suits you. And when you find that instrument, learn its trading personality and then stick with it because leverage is where eventually you're gonna make your money. In other words, you're not gonna, you know, put a ton of dough in your trading account trading one little contract and hoping to catch a big run. The key is going to be working yourself up to two, four, six, eight, ten contracts once you can really get the trading of your chosen instrument down, whatever it is. In fact, we have some folks in here tonight. Let me mention a couple other instruments, and we'll get off of this, that you can look at if you're considering trading futures. One of them is the dollar index. Anybody in here trade a dollar? DX? This is also $5 a tick. So when we say $5 a tick, that means each tick of movement on the chart for that instrument is equal to $5, okay? So in terms of risk, uh, uh, given a certain uh, uh, an initial stop and your targets, the risk return is, is less with a $5 instrument like YM, NASDAQ, and the dollar. The risk is half as much, right? as a $10 tick instrument like crude oil and the Russell. So for instance, on NASDAQ, if you had a, a 12 tick initial stock, 10 tick, 12 tick initial stop, if you get popped, you'll lose how much? Five times 10, 50, five times 12, 50 or $60, right? Now you take, contrast that with crude oil or the Russell at $10 a tick for that same equivalent amount 12 tick stop, you lose twice as much, $120, yes? So it's a risk return thing, right? So the flip side of that though is you would say to yourself, well, now in order to make as, money, make as much money on the Russell as trading the YM, I have to trade two contracts to equal one on the Russell. Now that's true. Some questions coming in about other instruments. Now, um, Ian, you've asked about the, the DAX and FGBL. The DAX is, is the equivalent of the German uh, Dow, essentially. That's their top uh, sort of, it, it's, it's, you know, essentially it's like the, the German Dow, okay? Um, we used to watch that. This tr primarily trades very heavily in the after hours in the European session, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, FG, FGBL is the German Bund futures. Um, 
I personally think these two instruments are kind of like a woolly beast. Yeah, 3 a.m. Eastern. Okay, so, so yeah, the European session essentially runs from midnight Pacific, 3 o'clock Eastern, all the way through 8:30 in the morning, but a lot of the a lot of the uh, volatility occurs very early. So if you're a night owl, if you're up late, um, if you like to trade after hours, uh, then in the European session you can look at the DAX, you can look at the the FTPL, and any of the currencies, particularly the British pound, uh, 6E, and the Swissy 6S futures. All right. So that's primarily the instruments that we work with. Um, uh, we have some traders that trade gold. Uh, it's another good mover. ES, of course, is the E-mini S&P. That's 12.50 a tick. Now, you talk about a slow mover. I'll show you an ES chart before we close up here. ES can stay in mind-numbing ranges, like, for hours at a time. Okay, so if you like a sl slow-moving instrument, you can look at ES. If you want something with some more movement to it, then you really got to look at some of these other instruments because that's, that's a sleeper. That's a sleeper. All right, so that's the instruments. Now, when you when you have a chart, we like the four range chart. Many years ago, we got away from time based charts, and the reason we got away from time based charts is that is that and I think Gary showed this the other day in a, in one of his webinars. When you artificially constrain a market based on a time increment, whether it's two, three, four, five minutes, what it doesn't matter what you pick here. You're going to notice that I'm not going to do it because I have my charts all set. But if you look at a minute chart. You're going to notice that there's huge spikes. You know, you get a huge bar, right, in like five minutes, just an enormous bar. And then what will it do? It's chopped sideways, just in a little tight little range. Top. And then you get a huge bar. And so what happens is there's really, it becomes very difficult to trade that. I mean, many years ago, we used to, oh, Lord, we used to have so many charts. We took guidance from a 60-minute, guidance from a 30-minute. What's the long-term Blah, 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 whatever, you know, and then we'd look at a 15 and a 10, and then we'd have a 3 and a 5 and a 1. Oh, we had so many charts, it was ridiculous. And I'll tell you what we did. We, we got rid of all that, and we boiled it down to a 4 range. And so that's the history of how we got to what you see here. Now, we also evolved our um, indicators. All the indicators that you see here, including the object trader panel, that Gary shows all the time and we use as a good tool. It's the OT panel. It's over here on the right. I'm not showing it because I'm going to cover more um, swing levels today here and, and um, ranges. I don't want to get distracted with the tool. But the, the very powerful tool, that's what the region boxes come from. The Ray tool is on there, the, the sniper line, all that sort of stuff. And we have training associated with that. <coughs> One second, please. Now, as far as what you see in terms of coloration of the bars, if you took all this off of here, you would just see plain candlesticks. So part of the thinking of what we did here is we wanted to introduce some color, uh, and we did it in such a way that made it visually trying to make it easy to see what's going on in the market. So generally speaking, and I'm just going to use some generalities here uh, to, to just give you some orientation, uh, there's much more to it than this, but just to give you some orientation, okay? So if you're above the mid band and the market and the bars are blue and you are stair-stepping up, like such, you are said to be in an uptrend. Now, the way we trade uptrends is that we wait for a thrust or we can take what's called a mid-band box. So uh, in the room, you're going to hear a lot of box that in there. And boxing it in there means that you put a region box from the object trader tool, the panel over here. We activate it. We turn on the long or the short side. And we allow the market to get filled, long or short. And we have the trade, like such. Now. If you miss the thrust move, one of the things, this is called the thrust move, so this is in the direction of the trend or the new trend that's forming. One of the important things to keep in mind is that we never, 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 this is a cardinal rule of ours, buy or sell after the thrust has occurred. So if you're buying and getting into markets and you're always getting stopped out because it's pulling back, it's probably because you're buying into the thrust. 
the place to get in the trade is here on this particular example. Now, notice what happens here. This, this is sort of our bre bread and butter, meat and potato, whatever you want to call it, go-to trade for trends. It's called the retracement trade. And ideally, we're looking for the market to come down and sit at or around this thick, chunky middle band right here to re-enter the trade. And that's where we deploy the use of our different types of tools. We have the line trader, right? When it breaks, it gets in. We have the ray trader out of the OT. We have the region box around the mid band. And then we can toggle over here on the box long or short or both. In the case of an uptrend, we only take the long side. We disable the shorts. And the reason for that is that we, if the market happens to go a little deeper than we think, <coughs> excuse me, comes way out here and checks this outermost band and then bounces, we don't want to be short and then stop out unless it's a trend change, right? So in this case here, we got filled on this bar that broke out of the box and we got a beautiful long trade out of it right here. Quick word about stops. You're going to hear in the room a lot of comments about loose stops and tight stops and all manner of stops like that. You know, the fact of the matter is when you're in the, in the beginning stages of kind of picking this system up, you know, you can sort of focus on the, 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 the stops. Generally speaking, the, the tight stops are going to kind of follow this, this, uh, uh, this line six right here. See this outermost line? And you see the, this thick, chunky green line? that snakes up around it, that's called a stealth. We've had that forever. It's one of the original indicators we had. It just kind of stuck with it. It's called a stealth line. And you're going to notice that the stops tend to hover right around here for the tight stops, right? Loose stops are always going to be a little further behind it. Loose stops are going to give this stop line and the stealth line a little bit more wiggle room. So that's the difference. If you're ever wondering, why are they calling out two stop levels? This makes no sense. Why, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it, because in some cases for scalpers who trade this system, they will get in, they will stop out, they will re-enter. They will stop out, they will re-enter. And they could punctuate what could be one trade into perhaps two or three legs of the trade. Okay, everybody see that? You know, leg one, pull back, stop out, get back in. Leg two, pull back, stop out. Leg three, get in, stop out, and then we have something different over here. So that's what that is. That's, um, that's a quick explanation of what all that is, okay, and how that all that works. Everybody see that? Now, when we get into a trend change, generally speaking, you're going to see something like this. This is a good example of it right here. Um, we come down to the mid-band to a fresh swing. Generally, that could be at or near the outside band. Now, that's called a phantom. So when you have a, uh, when you have a, uh, if you're wondering well, what's a phantom, what are they talking about? Is that some ghost flying around out there? No, a phantom, phantom would be when you have a trend, like an uptrend, for instance. And it, we used to call this in the old days, we used to call this a deep retracement. Anybody remember that? Any of the folks have been with us for a while? Remember the old deep retracement? That's a deep retracement. Essentially, that's kind, of, that's kind of a phantom trade. That's coming to the outermost band. Excuse me, it bounces. And the target for that trade is, is generally going to be up here around the mid band. And a, uh, we used to call it a red bar probe. Carl, you remember that? <laughs> the bars turn red. That's right. So you're technically still kind of in an uptrend, and the bars turn red. That's a deep retracement. We used to call that a red bar probe. You're right. Back in the old days. Yeah, you've been around a long time, huh? Um, anyway, so yeah, so, so what happens here then is that where the trend change comes into play is that it comes up, it checks a lower high here, and then rolls over and breaks the support. Notice what happens that the background changes to red, bars get to ch change to red, the, uh, all the bands, including the mid-band, start stair-stepping down. You have a red stealth line. These are all clues that the trend has changed from up to down. Now. So that is, that is the essence, you know, in, in 10 minutes or less about what an uptrend and a downtrend and how we look at that and how we trade them. Now, we all know that the market doesn't trend all the time. In fact, quite the opposite is true. It spends a lot of time in ranges. So in order for you to be successful in the long term, I know many of you, how many of you don't like trading ranges? 
just a quick poll show of hands of the team here. You can just type in, you know, no, I don't like, you know, whatever you want to type in. How many of you do not like trading ranges? Some of you like trading ranges, some don't. I'm down with ranges? I know you are, David D. Well, you've been around a while, so you've picked it up. Boo. No, it's getting better, Roger says. I love them, says Mary. Hey, Mary, I didn't see you come in. Byron, no, Doug. I trade a ran, uh, uh, tra uh, ran only with a trend. That's a good point there, Doug. Yeah, it's it's easier to trade a, a, a range when you're in a trend and then it goes into it sideways. You can trade that a lot easier. Um, so let's go over here. Let's look at what happens. This would have been transitioning from, uh, let's see, what was today? This was yesterday, huh? Let's fast forward to today because I want to skip ahead into our topic for tonight. And I'm going to expand the topic ex itself from the from whipsaw, the term whipsaw, to uh, because you can't really understand what a whipsaw is until we define, you know, how we can see what a whipsaw is ahead of time, right? I mean, you can't really see and know what to do with a whipsaw it, it, unless you know ahead of time you've prepared yourself for it, right? That's what we're about to do right now. I fast-forwarded the YM chart to this morning. Now, just to orient you here, here, here's the procedure of what we like to do every morning. This is what I do every morning, and some variation of this is pretty much what Gary does every morning to prepare to trade for the day, and I would strongly urge everybody in here to do it. What is the first thing we do when we get up in the morning and our charts are right there? And you can either boot up in the morning. I personally, what I do is, is every night my routine is I save everything, I power down, I, I give, let the machine rest a little bit. Sometimes I'll go eat dinner or whatever, and I'll come back, power the machine back up, I'll put Ninja Trader on, I'll scrub the database, connect to the data feed, and then I'll prepare all my charts for the morning. So that when I get up and I'm ready to trade, I don't have to go through that whole routine. I don't have to spend a half an hour rooting everything, scrubbing database, getting everything ready. I just turn on my screens and I'm pretty much ready to go. But what's the first thing we do? First thing we do. Success in trading, my friends. Everybody in here tonight, let me share this with you. I've been trading for over 20 years. One, and this might sound stupid and boring to you. But it's critical to your success is you have to establish a routine. A routine is something that you do every day. Because it takes to, to really be successful in the long term is you gotta have discipline. You gotta have a routine. It might sound boring. I hate to do the same thing every day, but you know what? If you don't follow the routine, you can get whacked. And that means like blowing up your account and you can't trade anymore. So we don't want to do that. So the first thing we do is we draw lines on the chart. Where are those lines going to go? By the way, thank you. Everybody answered that. Uh, Doug, Carl, G, Roger, Pete, and Kenneth all correctly said you've got to draw those lines. Now, for this one, I'm going to help you. Okay? It doesn't have to be complicated. It can only take a matter of seconds. We take our line tool, and we look where there is a confluence of a number of swings that are all kind of coming together. So you can see right here, support resistance, that we have one, two, three a number of candles that have come up into here. So what do we do? Boom, just like that. We put a we put a line right there. It's literally that simple. Let's do a couple more. Where else do we see support and resistance that we, we might want to put a line preparing to trade for the day? So we get our line tool and looking around here from left to right, here's the left part of the chart looking back. Now as your eyes scan through here, do, do you see this area right here where I'm putting my drawing tool? Everybody see that? Kind of right in there? Yeah, you all typed it in. Roger said 515. Okay, good. How about right in here? See how simple that is? It doesn't take long, and it's not really complicated, and I'm going, to, I'm going to show you this makes a huge difference in your trading throughout the course of the morning and throughout the course of the rest of the day. Okay, where would another line go then? 
Let's put a couple more on here and then we'll be done. Anybody? Well, I don't know. I kind of see some support kind of uh, right in here. And then, of course, you can see that the swing low for the pre-market session is down in here. Now, what is our rule of thumb in regards to these sets of lines? Are we trending? If we stay inside these lines, are we trending yes or no? See, that's why we did it ahead of time. The market's getting ready to open. This is 629. Most of you know, of course, I'm here in California. Pacific time, 630 is the market open. So before the market opens, we have these lines on our charts. Everybody. Are we trending? If we stay within the confines of these lines, are we trending yes or no? Simple question. The more you participate, the more you learn. That's all I can say. Uh, Roger, Doug, Pete, Carl coming away and in, Kenneth, Mary C. Trending yes or no, if you stay within the confines of these lines? No. This is not a trend. This is range-bound choppiness. You are going sideways. Right? So now that you determine that, that's the first part, right? We determine, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, I see it. I see your point there, Charles. We're going sideways. Now, what does that mean to me? Does that mean you're going to trade it? How are you going to trade it? Let's advance the chart a little bit and go into the open, and let's see what happened, and we'll talk about it. Okay? Let's advance a little bit here. Where was I? Okay, right here at the open. Oops, I adjusted the chart a little too much. Uh, there we go, I'm back to where I was. Okay, let me start. Here we go. All right, 6.30, market's opening. Now, when you see a market that looks like this on the right-hand side, basically from about 1.30, just to orient you here, uh, the European session started here, midnight Pacific time would have been here. So this is the Euro session kicking off. Here we can see it chopped around up here, and then it dropped around down here. As our primary mode of entry, if you're going to trade the range, and I'm going to ask this question, I'll give you 30 seconds to answer it, just to make sure everybody's paying attention here. That's going to outline the top and bottom of the range, let's say right up in here, or even right up the mid-band. Is your primary mode of entry to take shorts at resistance and cover the shorts at support. You would type in an S. That would be your primary mode of entry. If your primary mode of entry is long, you would be buying support in the range and taking profits at the top of the range. That would be L for long. And finally, if you're going to trade both sides of this market, you would take shorts at the top and you would cover and get long at the bottom, type in a B for both. So what we're doing here is we are trying to determine, we have put our lines on the chart, it's clear to us that um, we, are in, we are range bound, we know that. Then the question becomes, how am I going to trade it? Am I shorting resistance and covering? Am I buying support and taking profits up here? Or am I flipping back and forth? I'm getting long, I'm flipping, getting short. Flipping, getting short, you might get along. Getting long, getting short. Flipping, B, both sides. I'm trading both sides. Making money up, and I'm making money down. Now, I'm asking this question because there are several clues on this chart that will help you to answer the appropriate way to approach this. Right? There are clues here that are telling us which direction we want to trade it. We're shorting, we're shorting resistance, buying, or both. Time's up. Time's up. And most of you, all of you, let's see here, Carl G., Pervez, Roger David D., Mary C., David, Doug, have all said shorts only. Good, Doug. Perfect. So the way we determine how, what our primary mode of entry on, on approaching trading a range 
is we have to factor in whether the market is sideways to down. In other words, in this case, and some of you have pointed this out in your comments, that we have broken support levels. The background is red. Although we are sideways, our bars are primarily red, and we are still continuing to gradually, very, very subtly and gradually stair-step down. So the primary mode of entry is short. We are shorting resistance, and we are taking, covering our profits, taking profits on our shorts at support. We wait for the retrace, we short it, and we take our coin. We short it, and we take our coin. And we continue to do so as long as that. Because if the trend, if the background is red, and the overall prevailing trend is still down, however you're range bound, it becomes very dangerous to try to pick up support buys because eventually if you get a breakdown here and the market sells off and you're trying to buy support, you're going to get creamed. So I know it might be tempting to say, well, Charles, that's a pretty, that's a pretty well defined uh, excuse me, support resistance area. Why wouldn't I just be buying after I cover and make that 20, 30 ticks back up? And you could. Some traders do that. I mean, if you're very astute and very good at getting in and out of ranges, you absolutely could do that. But you have to realize if you do that, um, you know, eventually it's going to break down and you're going to get creamed. Like here, for instance, if you had bought, if you try to cover your, your short and then buy it back and try to get long here, here's a good example of how it would have whacked you. See it? See the fresh low it put in right here? <clears throat> So even though we're in a range and we're going to trade it, if we want to trade it, then we have to know what our primary direction to enter it is. Yeah, Carl G, it is flipping both sides in a range is a really tough way to try to make money um, because you wind up getting whipsawed around, and that's the whole thing we're trying to avoid is getting that whipsaw. So you you got you to gotta kind of pretty much pick a direction and stick with it as long as it's playing out correctly, right? Now, as I recall, I think we took this short. Remember? We called this rollover. In fact, we took it. I, I, I think I took this trade. I was in this trade for a while. I took that rollover right after the open. Right here, 629 came down, boom, came right up and rolled. Remember? We got in it, hit the scalper coin, and went down to here. Remember? Anybody take that with me? Remember that short? Taking the short on YM? We were in it for quite some time. And then right before 6 o'clock, we covered 7. Some guy, a few of you got a piece of it. Good. All right. Now, here's what you want to do about shorts, I mean uh, trading ranges, is two questions in regards to this. We have a scenario where we discussed earlier about leveraging our trades. When we say leveraging our trades, we're putting multiple contracts on. That's more than one or two. When I say multiples, I'm referring to like 5, 10, or more, like 15 or 20. When I, that's a lot. That's multiples. Is this, would you say that this is an is a environment of trading that's conducive to multiple? In other words, should you be loading up for bear when the market looks like this? Is this an appropriate leveraging scenario in your view? What do you think? Load the boat. Look here, Charles, it hit the mid band at roll. Look at this beautiful trade. You can make some, why don't you put 20 contracts on that? What are you waiting for? Come on. What do you think? See, this, this is the thing I think that a lot of traders I find, when I Skype and talk with traders all the time, you know, there's this, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, how, how would you put it? Is <laughs> either you're, either you're kind of stopped or idling, or you got your foot on the gas pedal at 100 miles an hour, and there's nothing in between, right? No, no, no. All, all market scenarios are not created equal. And so let's, let's use exercise a little judgment here. And let me speak to what I'm, I'm trying to address. And th what it, the reason that we want to leverage up is that we're in a nice trend move where we expect to get nice runners. Runners that are going to go and go and go, and we can drag our targets out of the way, put multiple contracts on it, off it goes, and we get ready, we load for bear, it's real clean and clear where to get in, and the market is trending, and we're expecting long-running moves. We would leverage up in that case, yes? In the case of a range bound with a very tight range, you know, this thing's 20, 30 ticks top to bottom, we are not expecting big moves, 
right? It's clear to us, and we all agreed, and Pinky swore and took a pact, a solemn pact, and all agreed that as long as we stay within these lines, we are range-bound and we are not trending. Not trending equals not leveraging up, okay? Because the risk is too high on a stop out, and we're not going to get the payout ratio on any kind of runs here. We are expecting it to come here, and when it gets there, and this is one thing that I know everybody fights in here. I know everybody's saying when it gets down here and you're in that short, it's going to break, and it's going to drop like a stone. Look at this thing. I'm going to take that out. Boom. Da, 100 ticks. I'm going to take my targets. I'm going to make a ton of money on this short, right? What is the likelihood? that's going to happen here when it gets here? Is the likelihood that it's going to do this? Or is it more likely that it's going to do, from a statistical probability point of view, what is probably going to happen when it gets here? Right, bounce. There's going to be some kind of retrace. So, I mean, occasionally it will happen. Occasionally, don't get me wrong, and I'm not clairvoyant here. I'm not looking in some crystal ball and telling you what's going to happen. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you have a well-established support area in a range-bound condition like this, you have to anticipate that you're going to cover that short and tighten your stop down into here because it's probably going to retrace. Right? We're covering. It's probably not going to do this. It's probably going to bounce, and then we're going to look to get out and re-enter our short. That's right, it's going to go back up to another range level and roll per bez. So what I'm saying is when you see range-bound conditions like this, we have to prepare ourselves mentally to deal with it and not try to prognosticate out into the future saying, oh, this is going to turn into some massive run. It will eventually. I mean, somewhere down the road, and this morning, by the way, it did. This morning it did. Eventually it broke out of here, and I'll show you that in a minute. But you can't, you can't, that's not the scenario now. You have to deal with the cards that you're being dealt. Now, I want to say one other important thing, and this is really speaking to everybody in here that's visiting or new, or you're on a trial, okay? It's really, really super important that you build your own charts using the template in the room, that your charts look pretty much like this or almost identical to what you see in the room, and then I want everybody in here to see the trades on your own charts. This is a fundamental thing that, that when, when traders come, they visit us or they join us, there's a fundamental misunderstanding. Everybody thinks, well, you know, you got the live room. I really love that live room because you, Charles and Gary, should be calling out trades for me, the trader, to take. Yes? I mean, does everybody think that's what the, anybody think that's what the room is for? I'm just telling, I'm dispelling that myth right now, just to make it clear for everybody. That is not what the room is for. The, not, the room, we show trades, we talk about trades, we take trades, but the fact of the matter is, everybody in here, we want, and that's why we spend to, so much time and effort teaching and training and showing these setups, to be empowered to set up your charts just like we have them, to see the trade ahead of time on your own chart on your own screen right here in front of you just like this right you see it yourself and then when you hear a call in the room related to your instrument like I might say something to the effect of you know I'll tell you what if that YM retraces anywhere up around the mid band at that 501 area and rolls over I'm going to take a short what we want you to do is we want you to have already seen that ahead of time yourself so that, in effect, when you hear a call on a retrace to get short, it's confirming what you're already thinking yourself. That's right, Pervez. Trade your own chart. That's, exact, that's, that's probably the best way to put that into four words. Trade your own chart. Right, trade your own chart. And the room is there to help you with trades you're already seeing to take them. Okay? Just, just, so I want everybody to kind of be on the same page about that. Because we still get sometimes, well, you should call that out for me. That's not the purpose of the room. Let's do a couple more on here and then let's move on, okay? So we come up and we come right into the sweet spot here. What's the market doing? At 6.46 Pacific time, right here, let me blow it up. In fact, I, as I recall, we took this trade in the room too, see it? Now when you put a region box around those candles right there and you enable it from your object trader tool, 
in this box, this particular box right here, this is a question for you. Are you enabling S short only or both, long and short with a B? Or L long only? Object trader, region box, S for shorts only, B for both. L for long only. This is kind of a little bit of a trick question, but uh, it's important we cover it. Look at your background. Look at the chart setup. Look at the ranges we're in, what we discussed. All right, this is kind of a trick question. I see a lot of answers coming in, a lot of S's and a lot of B's. All right, here's the thing. <coughs> I got a little tickle in my throat. <coughs> I get some tea. Hold on. One second, please. Now, part of the reason that was a trick question was um, in most of our training, we have said that the one exception to uh, if you're in a range or you're in a trend and you're in that first sort of 30 to 60 minute time window of the open of the market, sometimes you can get trend changes and you can, you know, uh, in some cases allow the market to trade either way, which kind of flies in the face of what we're teaching here, which is, you know, what we, what we said since way over here was that the market trend was down right? The market trend was down. Our background is red. We are stair-stepping down. You know, we have, uh, you know, we're primarily taking shorts only. For, the, for those of you that said S short only, then that, that would be my, my I, would, I would lean towards that direction. Because here's the thing, if it does pop up and get you long, in all likelihood, it would probably go where? Well, it might go to here and roll over and get you short again, or it might go up to here. So you might get a scalp out of it. But even if it did go up there, which it didn't, it rolled over and you got the short, by the way, just to let you, just to quickly show you what happened there. You did roll. We did take this in the room, and I did get, I did take the short, by the way. In this scenario here where it gets long, sometimes you don't have to be too concerned about it. I know, you know, a lot of traders say, well, you know, I, I, what if it runs all the way up and I miss it? You know, in all likelihood, there would be some scenario where it would, would break up, pull back, and then, you know, and then find some higher level of support and then do something like that. So you, generally speaking, would have some other chance to get in here, right? So you don't have to be too fearful of missing a move to the upside. But in this case of this right here, and, and, and the other thing, the other, the other risk that you run enabling both sides on a box like that is that you get the wick of a candle just closed just slightly above it like this. Oop, wrong, wrong one, hold on. Sorry about that. You know, somewhere over here you get a wick of a candle that does something like that. This is what we call possibly a double whammy scenario. A double whammy is where you're filled in the wrong direction. You've got a huge 12 tick stop down here. It rolls, it takes a full stop out and you don't flip and you don't get the short. So you take a total hit and then you don't get the short. Yeah, you get trapped, trapped in a long. Everybody see that? All right, I've blown a lot of time on this uh, chart. Um, what else do we want to see? Let's pull up some other before we run out of time. We're almost out of time. I've spent a lot of time on this. I, I'm sorry I went so much into depth. I hope this answered a lot of questions about um, how you deal with choppiness at the open. Um, any other questions on this? Because I want to. Uh, we're almost out of time. I want to pull up some other some other charts. You want to see crude? Do we want to see Nasdaq? Do we want to see six B? What do we want to see? Let me pull up a couple other charts before we wrap. And while you're typing in your instruments that you want to see. I will pull a crude chart down real quick here. Stand by, please. Again, some votes for NASDAQ coming in. Let me quickly go through an oil chart from today. Let's come back before 6 o'clock. Here is 6 o'clock right here. 6 o'clock, more or less, kind of right there. So where do our lines go? 30 seconds. Type in some numbers. 
It's 5 uh, 49 on this morning. You're going to trade the crude pit oil open, uh, oil open with Gary. You got your charts up. Looks like this. You're preparing. You're getting ready to go in the room. Getting ready to log in. Your charts look like this. Where do you put the lines? That's our number one thing, right? Where level? Here's the levels over here. Where do the lines go? We all agree number one thing you do when you look at your charts in the morning is put lines on your charts. Where do they go? What, what levels are you putting lines on? Fifteen seconds. Just type in one or two. You don't have to type them all in. Where would you put a couple of lines on here? Tomorrow morning you get up and you pull up a crude oil chart and it looks like this. Where are you putting the lines? Where are you going to put them? I know where I'd put them. I'm trying to see if you know where you'd put them. It doesn't really matter what chart you use. You've got to be able to see where you're going to put them, yes? Time's almost up. Just give you a few more seconds. Now I have to tell you that crude oil was pretty choppy this morning. It was really, it was a little tough to trade crude this morning. Definitely, no question about it. Very, 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 very tough market to trade today. It was very, very choppy. Wow. Okay, a lot of good numbers can coming in here. Doug, Pete, Pervez, Kenneth, Roger. I like those numbers. Byron. All right, let's do this. Let's see if you got them right. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put some swing levels in here that I think are appropriate to to uh, to to flag with a with a line. Obviously, I think everybody can see there should be one kind of right in there. Everybody should have gotten that one right. See all the little candle wicks that are kind of coming right into here. Now it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to kind of put something close to where you think it is, right? Uh, above there, yeah, I'd, I'd say another one kind of up in there. And then below there, you got another one, uh, well, you got a couple of them. I'd, I'd, say, I'd say kind of one right in there. And then let's go back a little further. You know, below there, I'd say, I'd say down, you know, kind of in this area down here. Did you get those right? Oh, Doug, you're on a laptop. It's tough to see the numbers. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I mean, you, you know how to draw the lines. I know you do. Good. Everybody got that right. Now, okay, we've said this before, right? If you remain within the confines of the lines, it is said to be that you are in range bound and you have to decide how you're going to trade it, right? So just like the exercise we did on YM, what's our primary mode of entry? If you're going to trade this range, are we shorting resistance? Are we buying support, B or both, S, B, S, L, or B? Long from support, taking coin at the top, or are you buying support, shorting the top, getting out of your long, flipping short? What do you think? What's your primary mode of entry on a range that, that looks like this? I mean, in a nutshell, if you think about it, that's really the two things that you do to decide how you're going to trade a market, right? You have to decide, you put the lines on to determine where the range is, first of all, right? And then the second thing is we have to determine how we're going to get in. Are we shorting? Are we buying? Are we doing both? Time's up. Now, interesting here, we have a lot of shorties on the market. But we have a couple of comments here from Pete and a couple others saying that you're going to sit on your hands. Now, i got to tell you something here, okay, and this is just a word of caution about trading crude oil on some days. Um, and that's why I have to tell you, I'll share with you, I am not as aggressive in trading crude as I am on instruments that I feel more confident in, like YM and NASDAQ, which I feel like at this point I kind of like the back of my hand. I have a pretty good feel what those instruments can do. Many, many times, you know, let me just advance the chart and show you, chart, chart and show you what I'm t t talking about here. Sometimes crude doesn't respect the swings as much as some of the other charts like the equities. In other words, sometimes it, it, 
it can it won't get back to a swing or it'll come just shy of a swing. You can have a lot of cases, you know, where it'll go a little further than you kind of expect. You kind of think it's going to do one thing and you jump in. And, you know, when crude is running and moving well, um, you can be rewarded very quickly and make very good money trading oil. There's a lot of big oil traders that make a lot of money trading crude, okay? Don't get me wrong. But, at, you know, at $10 a tick with a couple of contracts on there, if you're on the wrong side of oil, it can bite you pretty hard and fast, all right? So that's just the word of caution to be careful you know, trading trading the crude. Now, if you were shorting, uh, all these pops up to resistance. You know, every time she came up here and rolled over and you shorted it, pretty much each of those times you could see that th those were, you know, those were winning trades. I mean, the only one that could have bit you a little bit might have been, you know, depending on how and where you entered this. You got a little scalper out of it, and then it might have stopped you out up here. But then if you reshorted it, you know, somewhere in here on a rollover, you know, you did that, that, that turned out to be a winner. You know, these are pretty much all winning trades on the short side. Everybody see that? Short and out of the range on the rollovers? All those were winners. In fact, here turned out to be your runner. This is right after we closed the room. That was so frustrating. I got to tell you, we closed the room this morning after nine numbing chop for an hour, almost and a half, almost two hours, of just chopping sideways, mind numbing chat, and then the thing runs down. It just breaks and drops like fifty ticks. Doesn't that get your goat? <laughs> yeah. Ian, that's correct. Many, that's what they're doing on crude. They're running the stops. You know, they're running the stops. And, you know, everybody sees those stops, and they go up and they run them out, and then it's frustrating because they flip them. And this is, what, this is going back to what I was saying earlier, which is the whole idea of instrument selection. You've got to find an instrument that works for you. If you find something that doesn't work, if you trade crude and you trade crude and you trade crude and you can't make any money at it, well, then don't keep, you know, hitting your head against the wall. Go look for something else. There's 128 instruments. You're going to find something else you like, right? Uh, yeah, well, I am. all the all the uh, equities were good after late morning. All right, here's gold. There was a question here from um, Dave H. I'm a newbie. How about gold instead of crude? With the uh, with the turmoil on the dollar index and the Brexit issue with the British pound and the euro, there's been a lot of flight to gold for safety. And what that's done is that has uh, fueled very, very good volatility. So here's early in the morning, 6 to 6.30 would have looked like this. You had a very nice short trade to pan down on gold right here. Ah. Ooh, I'm getting late. I'm sorry. Drink a cup of coffee. Wake up. S excuse me. Sorry about that chopped around the mid band and then flipped right at the open of the equities and then gold had went on a tear here yeah you could have made very good money trading on gold today maybe any christmas look at this chopped around the mid band for a little bit and then you just gold went on a tear holy cow look at this boom two huge trades after the open boom boom and it continued up, and then it chopped around a little bit over here. So, yeah, I mean, gold's a viable alternative. It's working into the whole thing that we were saying, Dave H. You know, if, if you're new, you got to get in there and play around with different instruments. Experiment. Try with different ones. Use, put the indicators on the charts. Use Object Trader. you you got all the tools. Find an instrument you like. Let's go to 6B, and then we'll get ready to wrap. We'll take some final questions, and we'll wrap it up. No, we're running a little bit over, but we did get a late start, so that's okay. All right. Uh, well, 6B was kind of choppy today. Um, talk about range bound. Huh? Take a look at this chart. Uh, European market closes around 8, 8.30 central. Yeah, so you do get some movement sometimes on the 
on the equities and the currencies right right into the into the European close, David, which is 8:30 Pacific, right? Yeah. So here was 6B. I mean, uh, going into the uh, to the open of the market, you can pretty much see that it was in a it, just a huge range here, you know, with resistance sitting up more or less kind of in this area up here, and support kind of sitting down, you know, down in here somewhere. But you could make the case, if you look at it this way, yeah, you're pretty much range-bound, but you were putting in a series of slightly higher lows and higher highs. And in fact, in effect, you were kind of like in a channel, right? There's sort of a big old channel here. See it? Let's get these predictors off. It's going to make it a little clearer. So, you know, you're going to have to look at when you when you come into a morning and you see a market's doing something like this, if you're considering trading 6B, then you kind of have to pick your spots. It's not as clear and clean here on this particular one. What is the, what, what is the one biggest clue here that tells you that you are in a very choppy channel? Visually, what's telling you something here? Hey, we're chopping around in a channel. What's, what's, what's helping you visually see that? What is different on this chart than everything else we've seen tonight? Lots of colors on a striped background. Good. Well, hey, Walter, I didn't see you come in. Changing background color. Looks like a striped shirt. Perfectly. Yeah, exactly. You see the, see the inconsistency in the color back here? See how it's green, and this, and it's red, and it's this, and it's green. And it's, it looks like a striped shirt, yes? It's like a polo shirt or something. Yeah, that's your clue. That's your clue. And it didn't just start happening there. It, it looked like that going into the open, right? You already kind of knew that it was like that, right? Very spiky. You know, just a word of caution here. If, you, if, you, if you're very good at trading ranges and you're very good at drawing these support and resistance lines and you like those kinds of trades, by all means, step in and trade the zebra here. Right, Dave? Trade that zebra. I got to tell you something too. If you don't like this kind of trading, if you're just really not good at ranges, and you you know you don't really want to get involved with that, well then guess what? Pick another instrument. Put up a gold chart. Put up something else. Put up uh, put up the euro chart. You can put anything up. Go to something else. Don't continue to trade a market that you don't like the price patterns. It's really that simple. All right, good. Thanks for sticking around late, everybody. Let me stop the recording.